So in college, I lived off of a particular beverage. And it used to make my mother cringe. Did anybody literally really drink Mountain Dew? <laughs> I lived on it. I probably kept the whoever supplies that going at Western Illinois University. But um, I was teasing Jens just now because I said, well, water is usually up there for the speaker. He's like, no, I need my trusty Mountain Dew. If Mrs. Ludwig is listening, I wasn't supposed to say that. She told me not to tell you that he drinks Mountain Dew. So it's not, it's not really Mountain Dew, it's something else in the bottle. Um, he also told me not to introduce him because most people in this room know who he is. I will just say that we are fortunate in Chicago to have such a mind at the University of Chicago. And if you've been able to spend even five minutes with this master brain of um, crime and, and, and um, urban cities, um, you have been consider yourself blessed. So I'm gonna do as he said, one last thing, if you have questions, you still have time to get them written. It's helpful if you get them written early. Um, I'm going to say exactly what he told me to say. He said, here's Jens. Thanks so very much for the fancy introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. It's, um, it's really uh, it's a great honor to have so many people here. It's such a great crowd. It looks like an Iowa caucus meeting, except except that we actually have some vague idea of how many people are here. <laughs> oh, is it, is it too soon? <laughs> is, this, is this thing working? <clears throat> so uh, I'm here to talk about crime and poverty in, uh, in Chicago. And by way of backdrop, I wanna just start off building on, if you turned on the, the television last night, you would have seen a bunch of talk about how everything in the United States, how things in the United States right now are going so well. And there are some ways in which that's absolutely true. So this is a graph that shows you the stock, the S&P stock market index going back to the 1920s. And you can see that the stock index has basically tripled since the Great Recession in 2008-ish. And you can see that the stock market is now at an all-time high, an all-time high. You can see how much higher it is than it's ever been in the history of the country. And so by some measures, things are indeed going quite well. But I think you don't really have to look very far or dig too deep to realize that we have a lot of problems in this country as well. And so here's a few different ways to sort of see some of the challenges that we're wrestling with. So this is a graph that shows the poverty rate in the United States going back to the early 1960s. And, you know, if you remember in the 1960s, Lyndon Johnson in 1964 declared war on poverty. And if you just looked at what happened in the 60s, you would have thought that there was a lot of room for hope for the United States and lots of long-term sustained progress. You can see at the start of the 1960s, the poverty rate was something like, is that like 22% and then you know, by the end of the 60s, it was down to something like 12%. It felt like this was a problem that was really within the grasp of the United States to solve. And unfortunately, when you look at the 40 some odd years since then, you can see that we've made basically no long-term progress in reducing income poverty in the United States the way we usually measure this. You can see it goes up or down a little bit year to year, but really no long-term progress. And by some other measures, we've done worse than just treading water. We've actually had a lot of backsliding. So one of the types of economic indicators that for inequality that economists like to look at is something called um, social mobility index, which is defined as the fraction of kids who wind up earning more than their parents. And so I want to show you a picture of what that's uh, been looking like in the United States going back, uh, say, 80 years. You can see that it has been declining dramatically. The fraction of kids who wind up doing economically better than their parents has been declining dramatically. So you can see when I had my first kid in 1940, they had a 90% <laughs> chance I wasn't sure if it would be too early in the day for, uh, for a math joke, so I, I appreciate the laughter. Um, 
you can see in 1940, 90% of kids wound up doing better than their parents <laughs> academically. And for recent birth cohorts, it's down to something like 50%. And just on a personal note, you know, I'm, uh, I was born in Germany. I'm an immigrant myself. My parents are high school dropouts. I'm one of the, you know, 50-ish percent of recent birth cohorts who's wound up feeling very lucky to do much, much better than my own uh, parents. And so it's particularly striking and disheartening to me to see how less common and how much more difficult that's become in the United States. Um, so then you might ask yourself, this is the, uh, this is a Chicago audience, you might ask yourself, well, these are national numbers. How are we doing here in Chicago with respect to social mobility? And you know, one depressing answer is that overall we're doing abysmally. Um, you know, if you look at the 50 largest metropolitan areas in the United States, Chicago's rank is something like 32nd out of those 50 metro areas in social mobility. And by other measures, we're not doing uh, abysmally, we're doing truly atrociously if you look at the racial disparities in social mobility. Um, now, I did not expect, I've lived in Chicago for 12 years, I did not expect Chicago to be particularly good with respect to racial disparities and social mobility. I was nonetheless surprised to see that we are literally the worst city in the country for this literally the worst city in the country in terms of the rate at which kids wind up doing better economically than their parents, the gap in that between white kids growing up in Chicago and African-American kids. We are dead last. Now, this is a collection of economic problems that we obviously care about for their own sake, for people to be able to escape from poverty during childhood, during adulthood, to fulfill their p potential. It's also something that we care deeply about here in Chicago, as everyone in this room knows, because it's so closely related to so many of the other social problems that we're worried about here, including in particular the gun violence problem that's racking so much of the city on the south and west sides in particular. So what I wanna do with the rest of my talk is essentially argue that this relationship between crime and poverty is a little bit more complicated than I think we, we often appreciate. Okay, but as a way into that argument, I want to start off by thinking about um, the sort of things that we normally think about in terms of uh, trying to eliminate poverty. Okay, and in particular, one of the things that is front and center in our thinking about how to reduce or even eliminate poverty in the United States has been education. And so I want to show you a couple pictures about why that has really been so uh, such a key part of our focus. This is a graph that shows you, let me explain what this graph is or what this picture is. This is a graph that shows you inflation adjusted wages for men of different schooling levels going back to the early 1960s. So everything is normalized to be equal to, for each group, education group, it's normalized to be equal to zero in 1960. So you can see how the group, how their wages have changed over time, net of inflation. Okay, and so some of you have probably been reading news accounts about how a high school diploma has never been more important for succeeding in the modern economy. And I think with that, you know, what this picture shows you is A, that that's true, but B, it's not true for the reason that you think. Okay, it's true, so notice what's going on in this graph. Since the 1970s, so when you hear the labor market importance of a high school diploma has gone up, that makes you think having a high school degree is increasingly helpful, increasingly beneficial in the labor market, like you're doing better and better over time if you've got a high school diploma. That's not really what's going on in the following sense. You can see that since the 1970s, the real inflation adjusted earnings of high school graduates has been declining. The reason that a high school diploma looks better and better over time compared to being a dropout is not because having a people with diplomas are doing better, but because the drop in earnings has been particularly severe for high school dropouts. And for those of you who know anything about the deindustrialization of Chicago or any American city, you're gonna look at this graph and you're not gonna be surprised at the downward trend in the earnings lines for both of these groups, right? The other thing that has been happening in the labor market over the last 50 or 60 years is 
the huge absolute increase in infl inflation-adjusted earnings for people with some schooling besides high school, beyond high school. You can see that the earnings gap between people who have some college, a four-year college degree, even a graduate school degree, mm -hmm. and a high school graduate, much, much less a dropout, has completely exploded over time compared to the early 1960s. Okay, so what this means is, what this means is that, you know, when historically in the United States when we were thinking about how to reduce poverty through education, we often set the goalpost as a high school diploma, right? And I think what these data are telling us is that in the economy of 2020, a high school diploma is no longer a sufficient goalpost. We really need to be setting our sights higher if we're gonna try and help kids growing up today avoid poverty during adulthood. So then you can ask yourself how Chicago has been doing on that front. And you know, there's, the good news is that the high school diploma, uh, the high school graduation rate in the Chicago public school system has increased substantially over time, as you can see. And if you look at disparities in high school graduation rates between, say, African Americans and whites, you can see we still see disparities, but the good news is that those disparities are generally declining over time. Okay, so that they're trending in the right direction. I think the less good news is when you look at college graduation rates. I think there are two things that are striking about these college graduation rates for black and white men. One is that the rates are so low for both groups. And the other thing that's so striking is the incredible disparity in college graduation rates here, right? The college graduation rates for white kids going through the Chicago public school system is about three and a half times what you see for African-American males in the public school system. Huge, huge disparities in college graduation rates at a time where college is becoming increasingly critical to succeed in the modern labor market. So big problems here focused around schooling, increasing need to do more and more in this area. So it makes sense. It makes sense that when the city of Chicago or any city around the country is stepping back and thinking, what should we be doing to address poverty in our city? It makes sense that there's so much appropriate attention on human capital strategies related to getting kids through high school, getting them into college, supporting them to persist and complete college, like all of that makes a huge amount of sense. But what I wanna argue is that that's not enough. That's not enough, and I wanna argue that there is an entire category of thing, there's an entire category of thing that we are just not paying nearly enough attention to when cities like Chicago think about how to reduce poverty, okay? And let me start off with one illustrative example. So this is not the totality of items in this category of thing, but an illustrative example of one thing in this category of thing that we don't pay enough attention to. This is a, uh, a lot on the west side of Philadelphia. <clears throat> this if you've driven around the south or west sides of Chicago, you would know, you would agree that this could easily have been taken on almost any street corner on the south and west sides of Chicago in particular. And a few years ago, the city of uh, Philadelphia made a big push in partnership with the University of Pennsylvania to go through and turn a bunch of lots that look like this into lots that look like this. Huge difference. So the first thing you see I think the natural reaction to this for starters is, what an incredible difference. A second reaction that you might have at a talk entitled Crime and Poverty in Chicago is, well, that's great if I'm a landscaped architect or a member of the Parks Department, but what in the world does this have to do with its focus on poverty reduction for starters? What does this have to do with poverty reduction? Well, one of the interesting things about the way the city of Philadelphia did this with the University of Pennsylvania is, Philadelphia, like Chicago, has a huge number of abandoned lots. And so what they did is they basically did a random lottery to figure out which lots they should go fix up first. So what that essentially creates is something like a randomized controlled trial in medicine that lets you look at what happens around the lots that they fixed up first versus the lots that they fixed up later, what happens to the social conditions around those lots. And the answer is, reductions in shootings on the order of 
people, more people likely to publicly use those spaces, less drug dealing, lots of other, you can imagine all the mechanisms through which that is so helpful in reducing shootings. 29%, think about how huge that is, a 29% reduction in shootings. So you might be thinking, well, that's, that's great, but I still don't see, I still don't see exactly what this has to do with poverty, with, with strategies to reduce poverty. And so I think one way to sort of begin to see the link is you can look at data from the Chicago Police Department and you can ask yourself, when do homicides and shootings in the city of Chicago happen? And a huge share of shootings and homicides in Chicago happen between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. And then the second sort of question you can ask yourself is where do shootings and homicides happen in the city of Chicago? And the answer is fully four and five occur in public places. And then you can ask yourself a third question, which is who is out in public places between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m.? And the answer is literally everybody. Men, women, children, babies, everyone is out in public between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. This is unfortunately a key background part of the social environment in so many of the neighborhoods that we have, not just in Western Philadelphia, but on the south and west sides of Chicago and in cities all around the, cities all around the country. Now, um, you don't need a professor from the University of Chicago to tell you that it is extremely harmful for people to live and grow up in neighborhoods exposed to community violence like this. I think what the research does tell us that is more surprising is the magnitude of this impact. So if you look at the, if you look at the data um, on this, uh, Princeton professor Pat Sharkey did a study using Chicago data to ask what happens to people when they're exposed to violence in their community. And what he finds is that if you live within 2,500 feet, when you, uh, if you live within 2,500 feet of a homicide, there's a 43% increase in mental health problems. So because I, like everyone here, has no understanding at all of the English measurement system, we have no idea how big 2,500 feet is. <laughs> I thought that's 10 yards, 15 yards, what the hell's 2,500 feet? So, you know, if, what this means is that a homicide literally not next door has a big impact on you, that's one thing. But I searched the internets and learned that 2,500 feet is a half a mile. Think about that. Any homicide that happens within fully a half a mile of where you are has a huge increase in your risk of mental health problems. And then you can ask yourself, well, you know, imagine that I'm living in a community like Englewood, what is the likelihood that I would have a homicide in any given year occur within a half a mile of me? Look at the homicide map for Englewood. Most of the people in Englewood are going to be living in homes that are within a half a mile of a homicide in a given year. A half a mile is a huge distance, right? So here's the point that I wanna make uh, with this. So, you know, you probably walked into this room at least implicitly appreciating the idea that exposure to community violence is a contributing factor to mental health disparities between advantaged and disadvantaged neighborhoods. And I think what the, the data that we're starting to see in public health tells us is that this is not one risk factor among a long list of risk factors. Community violence is one of the most important drivers of huge disparities in mental health outcomes between economically disadvantaged areas and affluent areas in the city of Chicago. This is a huge problem. So now we can start to turn to more things that are even more directly related. So that itself, you can start to see the poverty tie, right? Imagine that you're living in a neighborhood, you're trying to search for a job or keep, keep a job, and you have a 43% elevated risk of a mental health problem, that already is not going to be helpful in any way to that goal. Now imagine you're trying to get your kids through school and help them succeed, right, in the spirit of promoting social mobility. Who would imagine 
Who would imagine that a 43% increase in mental health problems could be helpful for children and how they do in school? And uh, Pat Sharkey at Princeton did a different study to document the uh, magnitude of the impact on children's schooling outcomes from exposure to community violence. And you know, one way to think about the magnitude there is suppose that we went into Englewood, suppose that we went into Englewood and we fixed up every abandoned lot in the neighborhood. We'd see, if the results are similar in Englewood as they are in Western Philadelphia, you'd see a 29% reduction in shootings. And for the kids in that year, that first year we do that, what happens to the kids learning? They get an extra half a year of schooling. Half a year of schooling that year that we do that. So think about what a human capital accelerator that is for kids in these communities if we can address the violence problem in the neighborhood in which they're growing up. Or put differently, think about what it's like to be a parent or run a school in Englewood in the face of the gun violence problem, you are flying into a huge headwind against literally everything that you're trying to do. And it's not just human capital policies to try and reduce poverty. So it's not just human capital policies that are made so much harder from the presence of community violence. It's also economic development efforts, right? What are we trying to do with economic development? We're trying to get more people, more businesses, more jobs to locate in the neighborhoods that are most in need of that. And my University of Chicago colleague, Steve Levitt, did a study a few years ago and found that each homicide that happens in a city drives fully 70 people out. Each homicide that happens drives fully 70 people out on net. Imagine here you are trying your very best through economic development to bring in jobs, bring in businesses, and every time there's a fatal shooting, 70 people are walking out. Right? That is a huge headwind for anything that you're trying to do in the economic development space as well. Okay, now, sorry, right, let me go back for a second. And um, Now, I picked, uh, I picked the Philadelphia, um, you know, abandoned lot redevelopment efforts for, uh, to illustrate uh, a public safety intervention for a few reasons. One is that it was so well studied. It was structured like a randomized trial. The second reason is that I grew up outside of Philadelphia. And the third reason that it happened in the city that is the home to the 2020 NBA championship 76ers. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that would go over much better than, uh, than it actually did somehow. <laughs> but but what I, I want to be clear, what I'm not saying, what I'm not saying is this is about fixing up abandoned lots, right? That is just an illustration of the type of thing that we can do that we need to be thinking about to promote public safety, right? There are lots and lots of things beyond abandoned lots that could be done to promote public safety where we're starting to accumulate really good evidence that they're actually helpful. So we're starting to see more and more evidence that the private sector and local businesses have a role to play through things like supporting business improvement districts. Those can be incredibly helpful through a bunch of activities in promoting public safety. We're accumulating more and more good evidence that the right sorts of social programs can be really helpful in helping kids avoid violence involvement. Uh, we're starting to accumulate really good evidence that things like drug rehab for people in prison can be really helpful in reducing recidivism rates. So this is not about any particular thing to promote public safety. I think the, the larger theme that I want to hit here is when we think about anti-poverty strategies in Chicago or in any American city, we need to have anti-violence strategies much higher on our radar screen than I think than we typically appreciate. And so let me close then with one uh, final topic, which is to ask how we're doing in addressing the violence problem. So I've just argued that the gun violence issue in the city of Chicago is intrinsically and intimately related to the problems that we're having with poverty. Um, how have we been doing? So this is a uh, picture of the homicide rate per 100,000 people in Chicago going back to the mid 80s. And you know, here's the 2019 homicide uh, rate here. And so you can see that you know, by some measures, there's some progress, right? So 
The homicide rate in Chicago today is much lower, or noticeably lower than it was in 2016. The homicide rate today is much lower than it was in the early 1990s at the peak of the crack cocaine epidemic. And so there's a way to look at this and say, well, maybe we're making some progress. I think there's a way to look at this and say, maybe we're not making as much progress as we should be. But if you're gonna be optimistic, you might say, well, we're making maybe at least some progress here. Um, but I think here again, when you sort of lift the hood and you look a little bit closer, you realize that there are big problems here as well. And the problem here comes in large part to me, not just from the fact that we should be making more progress overall, but that the progress that we are making is incredibly uneven across the city. Incredibly uneven across the city. So let me first show you the uh, same sort of uh, graph, the homicide rate per 100,000 people for one police district in Chicago serving Lincoln Park. Okay, so this is the homicide trend for Lincoln Park going back to the 1980s. And you can see that in 1985, the homicide rate in Lincoln Park was about 24 per 100,000. That's about the citywide average in Chicago right now. It's about the citywide average in Chicago right now. And up through 2019, the homicide rate in Lincoln Park is now about four per 100,000. Four per 100,000. So a lot of people want to point to New York City and say, like, there's this amazing New York City miracle. Lincoln Park has experienced a New York City-like miracle in public safety. It is not that we don't have any examples of a New York City-like public safety miracle here. This is it right here, okay? Now, let me show you the same graph for a different neighborhood in Chicago, which is Garfield Park on the west side of the city. So you can ask yourself, how big is the drop in homicide rates in Garfield Park compared to Lincoln Park? Is it as big? Is it bigger? Is it a little bit smaller? What does the Garfield Park downward trend look like in homicides? And what you actually see when you look at the homicide rate over time in Garfield Park is not a trend that is a little bit smaller downward trend than Lincoln Park, or even a lot smaller downward trend, but a huge increase in homicide rates over time. So in 1985, the homicide rate in Garfield Park was 46 per 100,000. So just for starters, focus on that number for a second. That is roughly twice Lincoln Park's in 1985. And by the current period, you would say that was the good old days in terms of inequality and safety in Chicago. A 2x difference between Garfield Park and Lincoln Park was the good old days in terms of inequality and public safety in Chicago. Over that time, since 1985 to now, the homicide rate in Garfield Park has more than doubled has more than doubled. So when you go to the west side and you talk to people who live in Garfield Park and you say, isn't this huge crime drop that we've had in the United States since the mid 1990s amazing? Hasn't it transformed cities? Hasn't this led to all sorts of good things for cities all across the country? People in Garfield Park are gonna look at you and think, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> And you can see why. And so I think the, the, the final point that I just wanted to make here is, you know, the, the thing I think that everybody appreciates, the thing that everybody appreciates in Chicago is that poverty is an incredibly important driver of crime and gun violence in particular, and that's absolutely right. But I think the key point that I want to make is that the relationship is reciprocal in a way that we don't fully appreciate. Gun violence is as important a driver of poverty as poverty is of gun violence. So we have tons and tons of neighborhoods in Chicago that are in what you could think of as a vicious cycle right now. Lots of poverty, lots of persistent poverty, fueling lots of gun violence, fueling yet more poverty, fueling let more, yet more gun violence. And we want to be thinking about how we can turn that vicious cycle on its head to become a virtuous cycle. And a lot of our thinking around this is, well, let's, let's focus on fixing 
the poverty part of that problem, which is hugely important and we have to do. But in a world in which poverty is not just driving gun violence, but gun violence is also circling back and affecting poverty, I think we're going to be making, we need to make really dramatic progress in these neighborhoods to flip them from vicious cycles to virtuous cycles. We can't just be pushing on one side of this, on the poverty side. I think that we need to be pushing equally hard on both sides of this, on both poverty and gun violence in these communities to turn things around. Thank you very much. Dwayne, I bet your head is just spinning. Where is he? I know he's in here. I bet your data head is just like going crazy right now, isn't it? So on that bright note, thank you, Amanda. Um, thank you, Jens, first of all. I'm giving him a minute to. And thank you for not telling my wife I'm drinking Mountain Dew secretly under the uh... It's something else. It's not Mountain Dew in there. <laughs> Um, we do have several questions. Um, thank you all so much for being here because I think this is um, a hugely important topic. And I want to just take a moment just to thank the electeds, um, Alderman and Commissioner. And did somebody say that Kamara came in? What? Yep, there he is. Okay. So <laughs> um, it is so important, not that we just, we um, citizens are here, but also that the electors are here so they can see and hear this stuff. Um, is it Jay Chetty from Harvard? Is that the one who does? Raj Chetty. Yeah. Raj Chetty. Um, Jay Chetty's the internet guy. Oops. Um, Raj Chetty's study is amazing. And I think that um, from Dr. Ludwig and the other guy from the other gentleman that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. If we all could just read that information, we would be um, more enlightened because the numbers don't lie. There are a lot of data heads who I know get all this stuff, but actually seeing it on paper means so, so much. So um, how many people just by a show of hands grew up on the south or the west sides in Chicago? Take a look at that in this room, everyone. One would think that this room doesn't look as diverse as we'd like it to look because I like it to look like Chicago. But that's very telling because all of you all are enterprising and doing very well. Um, those numbers from 1985 to current to 2000, was it 17, yeah. 19? That's very, very telling. So we have a lot of work to do. With that, I think we'll get started with a few questions. So um, Alderman Capelman says, and he's not here, he did this via internet. He, oh, he's here. I did call you out earlier, but you weren't here. <laughs> I appreciate that at least he came. Um, so his question says, what are the main outside variables that affect outcomes of youth who later get involved in the criminal justice system? You kind of answered that already. But. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the only thing that I would add to that is um, the, you know, one of the most important things that keeps kids keeps people out of the criminal justice system is uh, education. It's one of the most important protective factors against justice system involvement. And it is the biggest social policy lever by far that we have in the United States, right? So here in Chicago, you look at the budget for the Chicago public school system, it's something like six-ish billion dollars a year. That dwarfs literally everything else that the city is doing to improve social conditions. And you look at the United States as a whole, it's like $600 billion. But the flip side of that is that once people come into contact, especially juveniles come into contact with the criminal justice system, there's really good social science evidence now that shows that if you take a school age kid and you put them in detention, you basically completely screw up their schooling trajectory, greatly increase the chances that they drop out of high school, and greatly increase the chances you, something like uh, quadruple the chances that they wind up incarcerated by age 25. So figuring out ways of helping juveniles when they come into contact with the justice system, like keeping the public safe, safe while simultaneously not taking young people and completely diverting the trajectory of their lives seems like a super top priority for us to figure out as a city. I very rarely do this, but they gave me the mic today. Um, Nancy Nasser from Ancona, where are you? So I, I just read your question, I think. Um, it's more of a comment, right? 
So I don't normally ask people to speak from the, from, but I'm going to ask you to speak to it because um, one Ancona is a great school, but the other is that I want to make sure that we get this right. So could you just say loudly exactly what you're saying here? Sure. So I, uh, for many years, taught in very marginalized communities uh, here in Chicago. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And you showed a graph of Lincoln Park and the decrease in crime in Lincoln Park, which is significant. And then you show us a graph of uh, Garfield Park, uh, where crime has increased. And my question is, one of the big challenges in Chicago is that people have been displaced. And one of the communities where many, many people were displaced was Lincoln Park. And many of those families were black families who were then moved to the west to the very south west side of Chicago, right. where there's just this spike in displacement of violence, which I understand it is one of the huge contributors to uh, violence. Um, and so I just wanted to know, I agree with so much of what you said, but that to me really, really stood out, because those were many of my students who then were relocated to communities that they were not a part of. Yeah, there's there's all sorts of um, there's all sorts of Im very important displacement dynamics kind of in the background to these uh, to these slides that I didn't have time to get into. Here's a here's a different sort of displacement dynamic or displacement challenge is when you um, when you you know I mentioned that every homicide that happens in a city, every homicide that happens in a city drives 70 people out, according to the Steve Levitt study. And when you look at the data for Chicago on um, who's leaving the city of Chicago and which neighborhoods in particular are being emptied out by the gun violence problem, it's disproportionately African-American communities on the south and west sides. So when you step back and you ask yourself, like, why are there, if you go back to the sort of the abandoned lot intervention that I was talking about from Philadelphia, why are there so many abandoned lots, so many abandoned homes when you drive around Garfield Park or Englewood? And the answer is the gun violence problem itself. And so I think the, like you're absolutely right to point out, like there are a bunch of moving parts here that need to be managed, right? If we are successful, or let me say this differently, what you are pointing out is the generic challenge of community development. It's not specific to community development due to improved gun violence. Anything that you do to make a neighborhood more affluent and more desirable for people to move in is gonna drive up property prices and is gonna create the risk of gentrification. Like that's just something in general that we need to take really, really seriously and worry about so we don't have the exact problem that you're, that you're mentioning, which is that the neighborhoods that are improving are the ones that wind up not helping the, the low income people who are living there originally who we wanna help. The flip side is if we don't fix the violence problem, we are condemning a bunch of neighborhoods to more and more emptying out and making it more and more difficult for the people who want to try and remain and turn the neighborhood around to do that in the face of the, this headwind of gun violence. Um, there's a question in here, and I can't find it, that he actually talks about with respects to making neighborhoods more desirable. So if I don't get to that question, because we have a lot of them, he talked about it there very briefly. Um, I'm going to work on this name, Zawaha McElrath. Zawaya. Zawaya. I was pretty good, wasn't I? I was close. Okay. From Europe, has your office completed any research with respect to workforce development playing um, in curbing violence? This is from. Oh, so the person wrote the wrote the wrote the question for you. Are you Jack Crow? Jack Crow. Oh, okay. So this is actually your question then. So it's Jack's question, not Zawaya's question about workforce development. Yeah, yeah I think, um, let, me, uh, let me sort of zoom back a little bit and um, broaden the question a little bit if I can, which is like there's a different, so one strategy that you could have to address poverty and the violence associated with that is through the sort of the K through 12 or K through 16 sort of system. And there's a different strategy, which is to say, you know, we've got a bunch of people who've reached adulthood and now they're trying to navigate the labor market and we could do different things with them. And I think if you view this through the lens of crime and poverty linked together, I think the, the group that we are sort of most focused on usually wanting to help succeed in the labor market is people coming out of correctional facilities. Because we know usually, yeah, the data show us that something like two in three people coming out of prison will wind up going back again within something like three years. And you can see in the data that a lot of that is very, very clearly related to workforce problems, earnings. Now, 
the, here's the challenge. Here's the challenge is that, you know, when we do, there's been a, a bunch of policy interest in social science studies of what happens when you try and prove the earnings for people when they come out of prison. And my reading of that evidence is it's, it's very sobering. It's much, much harder to do than you would appreciate. And the evidence is not nearly as, as good in terms of effects as one would wish. And I think when you look at the data really closely, you can start to see what the problem is, right? So, you know, MDRC is a research firm in New York City. They did a big uh, 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 subsidized work experiment for people coming out of prison a few years ago. I think Chicago was one of the demonstration sites. I think the Joyce Foundation was one of the sponsors of this. And the results aren't great overall, but then when you look at the control group that didn't get subsidized earnings, they're making something like $5,000 a year. So the subsidized job gets them up to something like $8,000 a year. There's a way to look at that and say, that's great, that's a 60% increase. But if you step back, you say, there's another way to look at that, which is to say, how can we expect anyone in this time to have any chance of living on $8,000 a year, right? And I think what that highlights is we need to be realistic about the scale of investment that we need to help people succeed in the labor market. And like, I wouldn't take that discouraging evidence as a sign that nothing works or nothing could work, but rather that if you want to have this strategy succeed, we should not be thinking that some $3,000 a year thing is gonna solve the problem. It's gonna to have to be something that's really sufficiently intensive and up to the challenge. So when you ask the University of Chicago professor to briefly answer some questions, that doesn't exactly happen, and I appreciate that. Um, but what happens is, you don't get all your questions asked. So, um, Dr. Lynn Hughes, I hear you, and I'm going to, are you in the room, by the way? Great. Um, I'm going to figure out how to get this one meshed in with another one. Um, it has to do with people and how we give access to, uh, to our citizens and some other things. Um, Ooh, I'm trying to like figure out how to best, um, this is the same question from John Petrovsky about how can we get residents and people engaged, but there is one, um, ooh, what did I do with it? Sorry, everybody. Here it is. So Ed Backrack, are you in the room? Great. Um, Chicago's homicide rate is three times that of Los Angeles and has twice as many policemen per capita. Is there something inherently different that makes police in Chicago so difficult, policing in Chicago so difficult and so very costly? Can you do that in 30 seconds? Yeah, uh, I think um, uh, Chicago doesn't have quite twice per capita LA, but I take the larger point that we have at least as many and, and probably more police per capita. I think one thing that you can see is that um, LAPD is among the highest functioning police departments in the country together with NYPD. And so I think, and they've been able to reduce homicide over a time period where public support in LAPD, according to opinion surveys, has increased a lot. So I think there are a lot of management lessons that we could learn from, um, from Los Angeles. The only other quick thing that I would say is, what is also the case is that when you look at the economically, the most economically disadvantaged neighborhoods in Chicago, there is no neighborhood in Los Angeles today that is anywhere near as economically disadvantaged as our most economically disadvantaged places. And so the types of communities that LAPD is being asked to serve are just qualitatively different from some of the neighborhoods that the Chicago Police Department is, is dealing with here. So the good thing is that because we have so many questions, that means that he has to come back again, right? Um, So there's a question here about how gangs are evolving, and I know that that's an entirely different conversation, and he may have to come and actually talk about that because gangs are not what they used to be. Um, they've evolved into something completely different. So I see that question. Um, Dwayne, uh, that's a whole lot. Where did he go? There's a whole lot going on. I'm going to ask you to talk to <laughs> Dr. Ludwig about that personally. I really would love to get to all of these questions. Um, but this last one is from Taylor. Is your last name Mac or Mock? Mock. 
Mock, where are you? Hi. Um, so it's an interesting question. In light of these glaring racial social disparities and assuming that we actually want to solve the problem, why are so many Americans against the reparations of African Americans? I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, it's a, um, it, it's a super interesting question, especially for someone who comes from Germany, a country that has its own. I was born in Germany in, uh, in the late 1960s, and my parents were born in Germany in the 1930s. And I think it is an interesting compare and contrast in thinking about how Germany has uh, tried to deal with its history and how the United States has tried to deal with, um, with its history. And I think it's not hard to imagine, I wouldn't claim by any stretch of the imagination that Germany has done things perfectly or even necessarily super well in any absolute sense. But I think if the United States kind of response to its history was at least a little bit closer to how Germany has dealt with its history, I think a bunch of things would be much better today in my own view. Wow. Absolutely.